I've always been a city dweller, far removed from the haunting quietude of the woods. My friends, John and Tom, on the other hand, were seasoned hunters, scoffing at the very idea of the supernatural. They put their faith in knives and guns, not in unseen forces lurking in the forest. So when we decided to venture deep into the woods along the border, it was a leap into the unknown for me, the novice among them. They were confident, dismissing superstitions as nonsense. We arranged our journey with local officials who'd fly us into the forest by helicopter. As we trekked toward the forest's entrance at the mountain's base, we realized we knew nothing of the forest's mysteries, rules, or the beliefs of the local villagers. While we walked deeper into the forest, I proposed we perform the forest opening ceremony, as the officials had suggested. John waved it off, saying, why waste time on superstitions? And so, we pressed on. After a while, my unnies grew, and I suggested we turn back. We hadn't brought guides, and I feared getting lost in the forest. John agreed, but Tom, ever the skeptic, insisted he'd been through similar forests before. He believed one forest was no different from another. So, we retraced our steps and as the evening descended, we decided to spend the night amidst the trees. We built makeshift beds high in the trees near a tranquil river. As we chatted, I kept urging my friends to heed what little I'd learned about the forest. They paid no heed, even showing disdain for the supernatural. One of my friends went down to relieve himself. I warned him to be cautious, but he paid no attention and ventured off. When he returned, I asked if he'd done anything reckless. Tom scoffed, what's there to fear? If there are forest spirits or ghosts, I'd like to meet them. His challenge hung in the air, answered by an icy wind that left us all shivering in silence. We lay down to sleep, a sense of foreboding tainting the night. In the dead of night, I awoke to strange footsteps circling our sleeping area. I lay there in the dark, straining my ears, but sleep eluded me. The footsteps persisted, and I turned to John, who had also awakened. Tom, inexplicably, slept soundly as if nothing were amiss. The eerie sounds of those invisible steps kept us awake until morning. Dawn broke, and we decided to leave the forest, but to our shock, we had not ventured deep at all. We should have reached the forest's edge by now, but instead, we were inexplicably still within its depths. As night fell again, we set up camp, weary from our day's fruitless hike. That night, as I lay on the edge of sleep, the forest once again whispered its eerie secrets. The sound of approaching footsteps resonated through the night, a disconcerting rhythm that grew louder with each passing moment. It was as if someone, or something, was drawing closer to our tent. The footsteps circled us with a sinister deliberation, a haunting dance that sent shivers down my spine. We remained silent, paralyzed by an indefinable fear that had taken hold of us. Then, without warning, the footsteps ceased, halting abruptly in front of Tom's tent. It was in that chilling moment that I heard it, an unmistakable gasp <gasps> filled with terror and disbelief. Tom's voice. With a sense of dread that I couldn't ignore, I knew I had to investigate. I unzipped the tent with trembling hands and stepped into the night my breath forming a misty cloud in the frigid air. The sight that met my eyes was beyond any nightmare I could have imagined. Before I stood Tom, or at least, what appeared to be him. 
His features were obscured by the flickering light of our campfire, casting eerie shadows that danced across his form. But the most unsettling aspect was his shadow, or the lack thereof. In the flickering light, I realized that Tom's shadow was incomplete. It stretched out before him, but where his head should have cast a silhouette, there was nothing but darkness. A headless shadow. My heart pounded in my chest as I struggled to comprehend the impossibility before me. I was stunned into silence, my voice lost in the night. Tom, seemingly unperturbed, regarded me with an unsettling calmness. What's the matter? he inquired, a hint of mockery in his tone. Why do you look like you've seen a ghost? The challenge in his words hung in the air as though daring us to confront the unexplainable. With an air of indifference, he retreated to his tent and disappeared inside, leaving me to grapple with the inexplicable vision I had just witnessed. As I returned to my own tent, my mind raced with questions and doubts. Could this truly be Tom, or was it some malevolent entity taking his form? The forest's secrets seemed to be unraveling in increasingly bizarre and terrifying ways. Despite the unshakable fear that gripped me, I clung to the hope that with the dawn, the forest's malevolence would wane. I convinced myself that once we were out of its shadowy embrace, these haunting mysteries would be left behind. Morning arrived, casting a feeble light upon the forest. John and I emerged from our tents, our eyes heavy with exhaustion. We exchanged a weary glance, our unspoken concern for Tom hanging heavily between us. But Tom's tent remained eerily sealed, untouched by the passage of time. It was unusual for him to linger in slumber in the unease that had plagued us since our arrival deepened with each passing moment. With a growing sense of trepidation, we approached Tom's tent once more, our hearts heavy with dread. I reached for the zipper, my fingers trembling as I pulled it open. Inside, we found an enigma that defied reason. Tom's sleeping bag was neatly rolled, and his belongings were meticulously organized. There were no signs of a struggle or a hasty departure. It was as if Tom had vanished into thin air, leaving behind only the eerie stillness of his abandoned tent. We called out for him, our voices echoing through the forest, but there was no response. Tom remained lost to us, and the forest's sinister grip seemed to tighten with each passing moment. As the hours passed with no sign of our missing friend, anxiety nodded us and the forest's eerie presence pressed in upon us. It was as if the very trees were conspiring to keep us in this bewildering limbo. I reached for my phone and attempted to contact the local forest officials, desperate for assistance and answers. But when I heard a voice on the other end, it was not what I expected. The voice on the line was filled with frustration and it spoke in a tone that sent shivers down my spine. Why didn't you bring a local guide into the forest? The voice demanded. Where are you now? I stammered, trying to explain our predicament and Tom's disappearance, but the voice on the other end abruptly cut off. I redialed, but there was no signal, and the forest seemed to swallow my pleas for help. Desperation and fear nodded us as we continued our search for Tom. We retraced our steps, scouring the forest for any sign of him, but the forest's labyrinth in nature seemed determined to thwart our efforts. Hours turned into a haunting night, and we once again found ourselves back at the tranquil river where we had camped the night before. It was a cruel twist of fate as if the forest itself reveled in our torment. Sitting by the makeshift beds, we clung to the flickering hope that Tom would reappear, 
that this nightmare would come to an end. But as the night deepened, a growing sense of foreboding settled upon us. The forest's enigma had tightened its grip, and the shadows seemed to whisper secrets we couldn't decipher. We exchanged helpless glances, knowing that something far more sinister than we could have imagined lurked within these woods. Our conversation was fraught with tension, our fear now palpable. Hours passed in anxious silence, and then we heard them, footsteps again, slowly approaching. We held our breath, the forest around us growing ever darker. As the figures drew near, we noticed they moved with an eerie grace, not quite human. Fueled by a mixture of terror and curiosity, I grabbed a flashlight and shone it upon the approaching figures. The sudden light caught their attention, and they turned toward us. My heart pounded in my chest as I saw them up close. These beings, if they could be called that, resembled humans, but they emanated an otherworldly aura. Their faces were pale and featureless, their eyes like hollow voids. I felt a shiver run down my spine as I realized there was no trace of humanity in them. John and I called out in desperation, but our voices seemed to vanish into the thick forest air. The figures simply stared back at us with their empty eyes. It was as though they existed in a world entirely separate from ours. We were paralyzed with fear, unable to move as the figures continued their eerie procession. And then, they simply moved on, fading into the darkness of the forest as though we had never existed. We were left trembling and bewildered. The forest's sinister secrets were becoming impossible to ignore. We knew we had to find Tom and leave this cursed place, but we felt trapped, ensnared in a nightmarish labyrinth. The morning light brought a glimmer of hope, and John and I were determined to unravel the mystery of Tom's disappearance. As we gathered our belongings and prepared to resume our search, a sound reached our ears, a sound like someone approaching. Our hearts leaped with joy at the prospect of assistance, and we rushed towards the source of the footsteps. What we encountered sent a jolt of relief through our weary bodies, a group of officers, their stern faces softened by our distress. Without hesitation, we poured out our harrowing tale, recounting the inexplicable events that had befallen us in the heart of the haunted forest. The officers listened intently, their expressions shifting from skepticism to concern. With newfound resolve, we embarked on a renewed search for Tom, leading the officers to the places we had traversed the previous day. But despite our thorough exploration, there was no sign of our missing friend. The forest had swallowed him whole, leaving behind only questions and a haunting emptiness. As we returned to rest by the tranquil stream, the hunter's voice broke the silence. His words carried a weight of understanding that transcended language. This is no ordinary matter of being lost in the forest, he intoned, his gaze fixed on a towering, ancient tree nearby. There is something more, something hidden from sight. Intrigued and desperate for answers, we followed the hunter as he made his way to the ancient tree. Its gnarled branches seemed to reach out like ancient fingers, their twisted forms hinting at untold secrets. The hunter disappeared behind the massive tree trunk, and a moment later, his voice rang out in his native tongue. The sound echoed through the forest, a haunting melody that sent shivers down our spines. So we ran after the sound. What I saw was that behind the tree there was a hole and inside there seemed to be something. The sight that met our eyes left us in awe and disquiet. It was a spiritual house, a sacred sanctuary nestled within the very heart of the forest. 
but its condition was a chaotic disarray as if some malevolent force had torn through it in a fit of rage. The air was heavy with the pungent odor of urine, an unsettling reminder of Tom's inexplicable actions during that fateful night. The walls of the spiritual house bore witness to his intrusion, and a creeping unease settled upon us. I couldn't help but voice my suspicion, my voice trembling with trepidation. This, this might have been Tom's doing. I ventured, casting a hesitant glance at the hunter. The hunter, his features bathed in the eerie glow of the forest, regarded me with a knowing look. It was as though he understood the tangled web of events that had brought us here. With a subtle nod, he seemed to acknowledge the possibility. But then, in a voice that resonated with ancient authority, the hunter began to speak in his native tongue once more. It was a language imbued with power, a language that seemed to reach out to the very essence of the forest itself. As he chanted, the spiritual house appeared to respond. The air thrummed with otherworldly energy, and the chaotic disarray began to take on a sense of order. It was as though the forest itself sought to appease the disturbance. The hunter's ceremony continued each incantation a step deeper into the forest's secrets. We watched in rapt fascination as he performed this ancient ritual, bridging the gap between our world and the supernatural realm that surrounded us. And then, with an abrupt finality, the ceremony concluded. We retreated from the spiritual house, our hearts heavy with the realization that we had delved deeper into the forest's mysteries than we could have ever imagined. As we returned to our tree beds, the forest seemed to hold its breath, as if awaiting our next move. The night was filled with an oppressive silence, and I couldn't help but wonder whether our actions had awakened forces beyond our control. The chilling cry pierced the stillness of the night, and my heart raced as I hastened toward its source, instinctively fearing the worst. As I approached the stream, a nightmarish tableau emerged before me, shattering any hopes of a hopeful resolution. Tom's lifeless body lay by the stream, his head submerged in the water, and his legs eerily protruding into the air like a grotesque mockery of life. The sight was a grotesque and disturbing manifestation of an unfathomable demise. The boots Tom had worn were neatly placed by the stream, an eerie contrast to the horror that befell him. But what defied all rational explanations were the footprints. They defied gravity and reason, the footprints only led upwards from the stream, as though he had been pulled into the air leaving no trace of descent. It defied all logic. If it were a suicide, there should have been footprints leading down to the water, not just emerging from it. It was as though some malevolent force had toyed with him, leaving behind this grotesque tableau. We were overwhelmed with grief and horror, and John and I struggled to pull Tom's lifeless form from the water. As we finally removed Tom's body from the water, a voice from behind us, one we hadn't heard before, spoke in a language unfamiliar to us. We turned to see a local hunter who had joined us, his face etched with a mixture of sorrow and determination. He uttered a solemn phrase, his voice trembling, and then began a ritual chanting words that resonated with ancient power. We watched in awe and trepidation as he performed the ceremony, his gestures precise and purposeful. When the ritual concluded, the hunter turned to us, his expression grave. He spoke in broken English, this forest, not like others. It has rules. No one enters without permission. No one leaves without respect. We couldn't comprehend the depths of his words, but we knew one thing. We had ventured into a realm beyond our understanding, a place where the rules
shadows of our world held no sway. And as night fell once more, we clung to the hope that the hunter's ritual would guide us out of the forest's sinister embrace. As the ceremony ended, we vowed to leave this accursed forest to escape its malevolent clutches and never return. But even as we retreated, the forest seemed to whisper a chilling promise that its mysteries would endure, haunting all who dared to seek its secrets. Thank you awesome audience for tuning in. Your support and enthusiasm mean the world to 